Hi, my name is Jeroen Lenslots from Siemens PLM Software. And we wish you welcome to this web seminar on the fundamentals of sound source localization. Let's have a look. Why do we need sound source localization in the first place? If you see a picture like this, an engine, and you don't have a specific tool, the only thing you can do as an engineer is to say, hmm, it sounds like it's coming from the engine, but we already knew that. Sound source localization tools have typical applications that solve issues with acoustic transparency, that try to localize noise phenomena, but also try to compare variants of different products, different components, to decide which one's best. Um, and also, they can be used to quantify the contribution of sound sources to the overall component, but also to rank them in order of importance. In this web seminar, we will discuss a bit on where sound is coming from and which techniques we will need to do that. We will see that the, one of the main techniques is called beamforming and that there also exists some more advanced methods to improve your results, mainly in low frequency. Talk a bit on how we can quantify also uh, sources using sound source localization techniques. And we'll finish with some examples. Now, for sound source localization, we need real methods. But by looking at these methods, you have to look a bit on what is good, what is bad, what is realistic or unrealistic, and also what are the different operational conditions of the product that you're working on. If you look at this slide on the left picture, that would be, of course, the most ideal method, a method that just puts an arrow on the place where the sound is coming from. But that's not very realistic, of course. If you look at the right two pictures, the middle one kind of shows very precise locations of where a noise might be coming from. Uh, and on the right, you see actually one which shows a very big red spot. And it's actually the whole, the whole red spot covers multiple possible sources. Yeah? So depending on what we are looking for and which type of problem we're interested in, one might be a good result and the other one might be results which we cannot use. Now, if we want to localize sound, why can we just not measure sound pressure? Uh, in this slide on the left, you see a picture where we actually measure sound pressure at some distance away from the source. And at each grid point, we actually have one sound pressure measurement. And if you look at that picture, it looks like you have seven sound sources. However, if we apply a real sound source localization technique, you will see that there are actually three sources only that are responsible for creating this pressure field at some distance away from the source. Yeah. So pressure maps do not correctly show source locations, and therefore we need some dedicated techniques, usually based on microphone arrays, including a dedicated processing to identify and localize sound sources correctly. The basic principle of sound source localization is the following. You have a source here depicted by two loudspeakers that generates a wave, generates sound, emits sound, yeah, and it's measured by an array of microphones. Sometimes it's called an array, sometimes it's called it's an antenna or a microphone antenna. That sound field is then measured, so we have measured sound pressure, and then we use a technique to call to back propagate that sound back to where the sound is coming from, to the source plane. And there are two main techniques that exist today, um, and already for quite some time, to, to do that back propagation. The first one is called beamforming, and the second one is called near field acoustic holography. We will mainly discuss beamforming during this web seminar but we will also touch on the near-field acoustic holography method. Now, beamforming is not new. It exists for quite some time. As you can see in these pictures, such techniques are actually already invented and there were experiments with it already a long time ago, usually in periods of our lives when mankind was not in its best shape. Uh, you see soldiers listening to sound coming out of different tubes in an attempt to locate where grenades or rockets were coming from. But the basic principle is still used today uh, and has been further worked on to create 
a method that can be used for localizing sound sources. Now, modern microphone surveys don't look like that, of course, anymore. They look like you can see in the pictures here. We have arrays based on analog microphones, usually compact together in a couple of circles, circular arrays with a camera in the center. We have them uh, very small or very big, like in the wind tunnel in the bottom picture. We have a large array with a lot of microphones. We have them in we have them in 3D spherical arrays where sound is coming from multiple directions and we want to use it to analyze where sound is coming from in a more reflective field. And we also have them in, like you can see on the right, in some newer forms where we use digital microphones, digital MEMS microphones, like you can find in your cell phone, for example, to uh, measure the sound and to use that to calculate where sound is coming from. I already talked about beamforming, but what is it actually? Beamforming sounds starts with the assumption that your sound source emits planar waves. That's not correct, of course, because if you're close to a sound source, you have spher spherical waves. So the sound travels from your source in a spherical way. However, if you are far enough away from the source, and what's far away, we will define a little bit later, and we call that the far field. If you are in the far field, we can assume that sound travels in planar waves. These planar waves will then hit a microphone array. And you will see, like you can see in this picture, the first microphone on the right will receive this sound earlier than its neighboring microphones on the left. And based on the time delay between these two microphones and between each microphone, we can actually back calculate where sound is coming from. We take into account the phase delay, delay of, all the, of all the time signals and then we sum everything up and we can have a, an estimate on where the sound is coming from. And we do that for sources that at all different positions, at all different angles around our microphone array. In this basic method, it's not important how far the source is away from the array. The only thing is important that it's far enough away and we need to know exactly the distance between two microphones because that determines the time delay between sound hitting the two or multiple microphones. When we want to look at quality of localization, we need to know uh, two terms from a beamforming result. The left picture is a typical result you get from such a beamforming method, where in the center, assuming that there's a source right in front of our array, we actually form the technique actually forms a beam in the direction of the source. We call that the main lobe. On the left, you actually see that plotted with, an, in a, with angles, so that's why it has a round uh, graph. On the right, of course, we can also position this with a straight axis where each uh, point on the x-axis corresponds to an angle but we still see the same we see a beam in the center next to that on the left and the right we see multiple so-called side lobes and usually the first side lobe which is the first one next to the main lobe is the highest one although this is not always the case as we will see in the next slides now the first quality indicator of localization is what we call spatial resolution and it's defined very exactly. It's the width of the main lobe, 3 dB lower than the highest level. So we go 3 dB down and we measure from left to right, can be just in centimeters, what the spatial resolution is. The spatial resolution actually depends on the wavelength and is multiplied with a factor. I see, see a small d and a large d but a small d is the distance to the source and the large d is the diameter of the array and lambda is the, le is the wavelength. In this case, we define the far field at a distance away which is larger than the diameter of the array. So the small d is at least equal to or bigger than the diameter of the array. On the right, I have a small table with some examples. 
So if you take 1000 Hertz, that has a wavelength of about 34 centimeters. So if you have an array of 60 centimeters and a distance of 60 centimeters, you will see that you have a you will see that you have a spatial resolution of 34 centimeters. That also has an impact for this specific frequency on what you can still localize and what you cannot localize. If you if your component is like a small object, like a hair dryer, the hair dryer is already bigger, is already smaller than the, the 34 centimeter spatial resolution. So on a small object at 1000 Hertz with beam forming, you don't get that, that good of a result. Yeah. On the other hand, if you make big power generators where all sources are very far away from each other, 34 centimeters can be more than enough to localize and separate different sound sources. So spatial resolution is actually the ability to separate sources that are closely spaced to each other because if they are in the same spatial resolution then we cannot then we cannot separate them from each other. The second quality indicator of localization is what we call dynamic range. So the dynamic range is the difference between the main lobe and its highest side lobes, which are usually the first side lobes also. So what we will actually see if we have one source is that we find a red spot in the center and then we go further away so the angle becomes bigger. We will see that the level goes down and down and down and like you see in this picture we go through an area where, there, where the level is really low. It doesn't even have a color, it's just white. When we go then further away from the source we start seeing something again yeah, in the color range yeah. and it's the but what we see over there that's just a consequence of the calculation we do so we have to take if we have a sound source which has a real sound source which has the same level as what as what as what we find there a little bit further away from this main big red source then we cannot tell if it's a real source or if it's a part of the beamforming calculation so and that's why dynamic range is important. We cannot see sources which are below the dynamic range of our method. If we have two sources, it looks like you see on the picture on the right, you see something, you see some kind of a, an interference of the secondary lobes at some part away from the, from the center. So beamforming can be summarized as follows in terms of its influence on frequency, number of microphones and array size. On the left, we see the picture where when we increase the frequency, our main lobe gets smaller. So we get a better localization of the source itself. Side effect, however, is that in high frequency, our first side lobes are not the highest side lobes anymore. And we start seeing ghost images appear at some distance away from the source, which reduce our dynamic range. In the middle, we see the effect of increasing the number of microphones. So the effect is that when you increase the number of microphones, your dynamic range get bigger because the side lobe levels are getting a little bit lower. Of course, this is not uh, linear. Eh? And when you add more and more microphones, the effect is getting less. And on the right, we see what happens if you increase your array size, but you keep the number of microphones equal. So the, sp the spacing actually increases. And you see there that when you when you do that, your spatial resolution actually gets better. Yeah. Um, that's that was also reflected in the formula that I mentioned earlier, where you say where we say that spatial resolution is proportional to the wavelength multiplied with the ratio between the distance and the diameter of the array. So if you make the diameter of the array bigger, then your spatial resolution gets better in general. Now, how does it actually work? the basic principle of beamforming in practice. Imagine on the top, we have an impact at a source. So we hit with a hammer or whatever yeah, at some point. And on the right, we have a microphone array, which is consisting in this case only of three microphones, P1, and they all measure a pressure, P1, P2, and P3. Now microphone one will actually, actually receive that sound a little bit earlier than the other microphones. Yeah. You can see that on the right, the peak of the measurement 
is actually shifted in time a little bit. It's measured a little bit later for each of the for microphone P2 and microphone P3. Then we will actually use a beamforming method to calculate back where the sound is coming from. And it actually does so by taking these time signals and for each of the possible points, so the black dots, possible points where the sound can be coming from, it actually does so by summing delayed time signals of the original measured signal. If we do that for the blue point in the bottom, yeah, we will get a signal where we still find three little peaks, but they are not coinciding. Mm -hmm. When we do that for the first microphone, however, yeah, for the first point where we know the source was coming from, we will see that all the sources shift nicely together, and when we add them up, we get a high level. So and that's, that's the principle that's actually used to calculate where the sound is coming from. So we will have a high level at exactly the point where the sound is coming from, and we will have low levels, and due to interference, sometimes cancel can, can even cancel out uh, the sounds that are the sounds that are not measured at those points. Now, what about if we want to measure something in the near field? Um, I will talk about a method called near field focalization. Uh, so our assumption of planar waves is definitely not valid in the near field because in the near field waves are more spherical. How do we define the near field? As a rule of thumb, I always use definitely closer than the diameter of the array. And to be sure, let's cut that in half. So we say half the array diameter. That's a good rule of thumb to define the near field for sound source localization. So if you have an array of 60 centimeters, then the near field is at 30 centimeters and closer. When these waves are spherical, the time delay between microphones no longer depends on the distance between two microphones, but it depends on the distance to the source, which is in this case the radius to the circle, to the sphere of the sound that is emitted by the source. Good news is also that our spatial resolution is improved. It's, it's improved up to or down to half the wavelength when you are at distances of let's say 10 centimeters. What's also nice about this is that we can actually say that the further we move away from the array, the more this starts to behave like classical beamforming. So it doesn't mean, so, and that's, the, that's actually because the angle between a source and two of its adjacent microphones becomes smaller and smaller. And when it's really small, it just appears like it's like there are spherical waves, that, that, that there are planar waves which actually hit these microphones. So there's no sharp limit where we say, now we will use beamforming, and now we'll use focalization, because there are now they are spherical, and now they are planar. It's something which evolves generally from one technique into the other technique. This sounds very simple. But in practice, we actually apply a few more smart things. One is called a kind of a weighting function, which gives a different weighting uh, to uh, the number of microphones. And it uses things like array density factors, and then does some level correction. And a second thing we also do is uh, we can attempt to normalize the levels that we measure, such that we actually can compare sources that are measured at different distances and compare their levels. So let's have a look how that looks like in detail. Com the comparison of beamforming and near field focalization. For classical beamforming on the left you see the car and we have a source which is inside the car itself. I think it's a loudspeaker actually that emits sound and we're going to see where this sound leaks through the doors of this car. So we're definitely further away than the wavelength, uh, further away than the distance of the source, so we can expect spatial resolutions which are larger than the wavelength. When we 
zoom in into the near field so we move this microphone array closer to the source we actually get a much better re spatial resolution you can already see that that the red spot on the right picture is much smaller in centimeters than the red spot on the left picture typical spatial resolution that we get here are about down to half the wavelength so focalization behaves like a zoom I also mentioned distance to the source where it's important in the far field well not so important in the far field but more important in the near field and to show that I have these six pictures if you just look at the top row in the center we have a sound source which is just a source standing on a tripod and it's is actually positioned at 60 centimeters now if we think that source of 60 centimeters which is in the far field is even further away our calculation result will not be that much different yeah? so at one meter on the top right you can see that uh, the shape of the sound source and the dynamic range is more or less the same however if we tell our software that this source is at 30 centimeters while in fact it's at 60 centimeters we're actually reducing our we're actually uh, reducing the quality of our spatial resolution so the size of the red spot is much bigger in the top left picture than it is in the center as it should be yeah? so it is important to have the source correctly in the near field however that effect is is really can be really killing you yeah? so in the center we have again the sound source right now it's at the it's at 30 centimeters which is the true distance yeah? if we say that that sound source was in fact measured at 10 centimeters yeah, you see on the left the bottom left that we get a very big red spot so it's really a, a bad improvement so it's a very important to have the good distance in the near field still it more or less identifies the source if we look at the right if we say that that near field source is actually far away one meter for example you will see that you get a kind of a donut shaped sound source which gives a very bad result on gives a very bad impression on where the sound is actually coming from uh, because this is an academical example with a loudspeaker we know exactly where the real source is but imagine that you have these effects in more complex machines where you are not even sure yourself which are the real true sources the dominant sources then having these wrong distances can give you a completely wrong image and a wrong conclusion on what's going on in your product yeah? so having correct distance is very important now that's a lot of uh, theory let's have a look at a couple of real examples the first one is uh, shows a short movie it shows basically how we can deal with acoustic transparency um, after we have scanned that we can actually make pictures as you can see here on this slide where we can visualize the acoustic transparency so in this example we actually located uh, sound that was leaking at the top of the door at uh, the start of uh, where the b pillar as we say connects to the roof where we find that uh, sound is leaking through it's measured more or less in the near field 35 centimeters and um, this is the typical experiment you put a sound source inside it can be uh, usually a mid frequency volume velocity source a source which emits uh, white noise or random noise between 200 hertz and 8 kilohertz that's sufficient for do these type of uh, to do these type of experiments and it's really done typically to uh, confirm that the that the seal the sealage of the car is uh, designed correctly and attached correctly it can be done by having either the array stay in a fixed position and from the inside somebody could move the tube of the sound source over the different uh, seals on the other hand it can also be done like i just showed in a little a short movie uh, that the array is actually physically moved over the seals of the door so it can be done in different ways another example is uh, that i want to show is about some non-stationary conditions um, and in this case we use the example of a washing machine um, or a dryer actually it's a dryer uh, the machine um, goes through a couple of different cycles uh, we see the door closed we see the operator push the button 
the drying starts and at the end the door opens and typically you have all kind of different clicks and sounds that happen and uh, this actually shows exactly where these sounds are located uh, is it locating exactly at the lock position or is it located at some other places during the drying phase where is the sound escaping uh, is it escaping maybe at one of the interface points where the the dryer is uh, standing on the floor or touching a wall that might cause uh, unwanted uh, vibrations or, or noises that are propagated to a house, for example. Yeah. So those are typical things that are uh, that are analyzed by by uh, white goods engineers. Here's another example where we say it's got it's like the moving operator example. It's a typical use case of sound source localization, where you see on the left in the far field, you measure something, you hear something. Yeah. It's usually a big red spot. And we want to know in more detail where this sound is coming from. So the first next thing we do, of course, is that we move into the near field at about half the array diameter in this case. And we might give some, uh, even use some real-time techniques that we can actually observe these results in real time. So such calculations can be made fast enough that you can do them in real time, except instead of only in post-processing. And then on the right, uh, we see a couple of sound sources in the center, by the way, three, sen three sound sources, but it's kind of a strange object. It's a, it's a compressor. And the question is, did we really find the sound source in this case from this angle? So on the right picture, you can see that the operator actually moves a little bit around the object to actually find better where the sound is coming from. And indeed, it was coming more from a source which was really behind the the angle that we were first looking at. Here we come to the end of this web seminar part one. If there are a few things that we would like you to remember from sound source localization techniques, it's these bullets on this slide. We've learned that the main applications of sound source localization are acoustic troubleshooting and assessment of different variants, but also to visualize the stakeholders where sound is coming from. Instead of having discussions on a tiny peak in a spectrum, you can actually show a hologram to show what the impact is of such a little peak. We also saw that beamforming and near field vocalization are the main techniques. And we learned the main quality indicators of sound source localization, which are spatial resolution, which is the size of the red spot, dynamic range, which is the ability to measure sources which are in the same frequency band but have a different level. And finally, the ability to measure in the near field. This concludes our first part of our web seminar Fundamentals of Sound Source Localization. For more information you can visit our website and there you will also find some information on how to contact a local office in your region. Stay tuned also for part two of this series which will focus more on some advanced methods of sound source localization. And then I would like to conclude by thanking you for your attention.